Hi everyone, this video is part two in the 3A series on development for AP Psychology students. So as you know, unit three is divided into two sections, part A that focuses on development and part B that will focus on learning. Today's video will cover the sections that are titled 3.2, physical development across the lifespan and 3.3, gender and sexual orientation. These are the key focus questions for today's video. By the end, you should be able to answer each one of them. These are the key vocabulary concepts that you should take note of while watching today's video. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. The College Board has the CED, which outlines all of the necessary concepts students should know, and they make a note that students should be able to explain the physical development before birth and how it applies to behavior and mental processes. So I want to start this video with the womb, which is prenatal development. Prenatal just refers to the time period between conception and birth, and physical growth happens rapidly at this stage. In just 38 to 40 weeks, one sperm cell penetrates an egg and that triggers a series of chemical events that will cause the sperm and the egg to become a single cell that will then subdivide again and again and again until it becomes a 37 trillion cell human being. The College Board names several factors that can influence development in the womb. They are teratogens, maternal illness or when the mother becomes sick, genetic mutations, and hormonal and environmental factors. When present, any of these factors factors can affect normal and expected development. Let me define that first concept mentioned because I imagine this might be one that you're less familiar with, teratogens. Teratogens are something that is a harmful agent like a chemical or a virus that can reach the embryo or the fetus and can negatively impact its development. When women receive prenatal care, their doctors inform them of common teratogens that are known to cause harm during prenatal development, such as alcoholic beverages, nicotine, marijuana, certain over-the-counter uh, medications or prescription medications and illegal substances. For example, when a woman drinks alcohol, it not only enters her bloodstream, but also that of her fetus, and it slows her central nervous system functions, but the fetus is also. So drinking alcohol while pregnant puts the fetus at risk of congenital disabilities, future behavior problems, and possibly a lower intelligence and in more serious cases can result in fetal alcohol syndrome. So depending on when the mother is exposed to a teratogen, it may impact the development of different organs and have different degrees of impact, as you can see on the diagram depicted on the screen. Teratogens aren't the only factors that can affect development in the womb. Uh, malnutrition, illness of the mother and genetic mutations can also put the child at risk for health problems or psychiatric disorders. If a pregnant woman experiences extreme stress during pregnancy, the stress hormones that are flooding her body may indicate a survival threat and then put the fetus in a position where the body starts to produce an early delivery, which could not be harmful for the developing child. I would say the biggest takeaway from this section is that students should be able to define teratogen, which is a harmful agent that can negatively affect prenatal development. So the next stage of development is referred to as infancy. And infancy is the stage of life from birth to about 12 months of age, and it's a time of incredible growth and change. This stage includes the newborn phase, which is from birth to two months. And then after that period, babies start reaching really big milestones like sitting, crawling, and walking. During the first few months, babies show a range of reflexes that give insight into early development and survival instincts. Reflexes are automatic movements that occur in response to a stimulus. They are a key indicator of healthy newborn nervous systems, and many of these reflexes in the newborn stage are just temporary, and then they disappear as the brain uh, matures, and then they start developing voluntary motor movements. One of the reflexes that you need to be familiar with is called the rooting reflex, and the rooting reflex is the only newborn reflex mentioned by the CED. 
immunity that babies are born with, but there are all kinds of reflexes that babies are born with. The rooting reflex helps babies find food. And when a baby's cheek is stroked, they will turn their head in the direction and will open their mouths looking for that food. This reflex is present at birth and it typically fades by about four months. There are a few other reflexes not mentioned in the CED, but I think are worth noting. The sucking reflex causes babies to suck when the roof of their mouth is touched. And this helps after the rooting, they open their mouth, it helps them to suck and then take in that food. The grasping reflex occurs when an object touches a baby's palm and it causes them to curl their fingers and to grasp tightly onto that object. The Babinski reflex uh, causes the baby's toes to fan out when uh, the sole of their foot is stroked. This lasts up to about a year, and this is uh, helping show proper neurological development. The Moro reflex is also called the startle reflex, and this causes the babies to fling out and extend their arms and legs whenever they're startled. And if it's a loud noise or something that gives them uh, a quick startle, they'll fling out their arms in the Moro reflex. The planter reflex causes them to curl their toes um, when their foot is pressed. This diminishes about nine to 12 months. The stepping reflex is really interesting whenever a baby is held up and their feet um, are held just above the ground and their feet, if they touch the surface, they will start to pull up their leg in a stepping motion. They also have a swimming reflex that allows babies to move their arms and their legs and hold their breath when they're placed in water. And this disappears around four to six months. As you know, depth perception is the ability to judge distance. And there are researchers who have studied when infants pick up that perception of depth. Researchers Eleanor Gibson and Richard Walk studied this in the 1960s with an apparatus they called the visual cliff. They created a platform that had a glass surface stretching all the way across and underneath it was a visual illusion an illusion of a cliff. There was a checkerboard surface underneath the glass that stretched about halfway across and then dropped off. So when an infant sat on the glass, it would appear if they crawled close to the edge of that checkerboard surface that there was a drop off, when in fact the glass stretched all the way across. The goal was to see if the infant would continue to crawl across the glass when there was an illusion of a cliff below them. So this allowed the researchers to observe how and when infants Uh, were able to perceive depth. Now, what they found was around six to eight months old, which is about when infants start to crawl, they would hesitate and refuse to cross the glass cliff, suggesting that they could perceive depth and recognize that potential danger. However, younger infants who were not yet able to crawl were less likely to show that fear, indicating that depth perception is closely tied to motor development and experience. This research has been fundamental in understanding babies' physical and cognitive abilities work together as they explore and learn about the world. By the end of infancy, most babies start to transition into the toddler stage, which lasts from about one to three years old. During infancy, the baby's brain is growing quickly and reaching about 70% of its adult size by their first birthday. The brain forms new connections between nerve cells in a process called synaptogenesis, which helps babies develop skills like seeing and hearing and moving and learning. Another important change that happens in infancy is myelination. And this is where the nerve fibers get connected with the protective layer of myelin, and this allows them to send brain signals faster. These brain changes are what helps babies begin exploring the world and learning new things around them. Motor skills or the ability to move also grows a lot during infancy. Gross motor skills, which are those big movements, things like using your large muscles are what develop first. For example, babies learn to lift their heads and roll over and sit up and crawl and eventually walk and they become stronger and more coordinated before they're able to really master those fine motor skills, things that involve precise movements, those start to develop a little bit later. At first, babies use those reflexive movements like gripping, um, but over time, they're going to start learning how to use those voluntary muscle movements to grab at toys or pass things between their hands or even pick up small objects with their hands and eventually their fingers. And they will perfect some of those movements like the pincer grasp, maybe they're grasping for a small Cheerio on the table or a small piece of food, and eventually they're going to be able to take that movement and hold a pencil to write or draw in childhood. These physical changes show how closely connected brain growth and body development are during infancy, and these continue to develop and grow as they move through childhood. 
adolescence is a stage of rapid physical change and development that happens as individuals transition from childhood to adulthood. During adolescence, significant changes occur in the brain, particularly in the development of neural networks. One of the most important changes is the continued growth and refinement of the prefrontal cortex, the area of the brain that's responsible for decision-making, planning, impulse control, and reasoning. This region of the brain is not fully matured until the mid-20s, which many experts say is a contributing factor to the impulsivity seen in adolescence that will diminish as they get older into adulthood, as well as some of the difficulties that adolescents have with long-term planning that becomes easier for them as they age into adulthood. At the same time, the brain's limbic system, which governs the rewards and emotion processing, becomes more active during this period, making adolescents sensitive to emotional experience experiences and rewards more so than when they become adults. And in addition to these changes, there is also a process going on in the adolescent brain called synaptic pruning, which is where the brain begins to remove unused or unnecessary connections between neurons. This process actually helps strengthen the more important neural ne networks, which helps improve the efficiency of the brain. The myelination process also increases during adolescence, which is a process where the nerve fibers are coated with protective sheath. This speeds up the communication between different parts of the brain, improving cognitive abilities, memory, learning, and coordination. One of the most noticeable changes that happens in adolescence is the adolescent growth spurt, which is a period of accelerated growth in height and weight. This growth typically begins earlier for girls, starting around the ages of 9 to 12, whereas boys, this growth spurt typically begins between the ages of 10 to 14, with boys then catching up and surpassing girls in height during later adolescence. Along with these changes, muscle mass increases and body composition shifts, with boys generally gaining more muscle and girls accumulating more body fat as they mature. A key feature of adolescence is puberty, which is the process that prepares the body for reproduction. During this time, the body's primary sex characteristics mature. These are the body parts that are directly involved in reproduction. Puberty also introduces secondary sex characteristics, which are physical changes that aren't directly linked to reproduction. In boys, these would include a deepening voice, facial and body hair growth, and increased muscle definition. For girls, secondary sex characteristics include breast development, widening of hips, and body hair growth. Now, for girls, there is another major milestone in puberty that's referred to as menarche, which is the start of the first menstrual period, which typically occurs between the ages of 10 and 15. For boys, the parallel event is called spermarche, which typically occurs between the ages of 12 and 14 and marks the beginning of sperm production. These changes are marking the body's transition into sexual maturity and the ability to reproduce. So as we move through physical development, it's important to take note of two terms that are similar but a little bit different. They aren't specific to adolescent development, but since we just covered puberty and the differences that occur in male bodies and female bodies during this time, I think it's just important to point out the difference between the words sex and gender. The College Board has one small note about this topic, and it states that students should be able to describe how sex and gender influence socialization and other aspects of development. Sometimes people use these concepts interchangeably because they are related and they both influence how we grow and how we develop and interact with the world, but they are slightly different. Sex specifically refers to our biology, such as our anatomy, chromosomes, and hormones that classify us as male or female. Gender, on the other hand, is about how our society or the culture in which we live expects us to think and act and behave based on whether we are male or female. And depending on the culture and time period you exist in, society may have different gender-based expectations, and these differences shape how people are raised and how they develop. These expectations can influence people and in how they see themselves, what careers they pursue, and how they relate to others. As people grow, they might also challenge these societal roles or identify in ways that don't fit traditional definitions, showing how sex and gender both shape and reflect who we are. 
Now, adulthood marks a large portion of the human lifespan and is marked by a gradual leveling off and decline of certain physical abilities. These changes are natural and are a part of aging, and they include a decline in reproductive ability, mobility, flexibility, reaction time, and sensory acuity. So first, let's talk about reproductive ability. As women move through adulthood, one of the most noticeable changes in their physical and reproductive ability is a stage referred to as menopause, which typically occurs between the ages of 45 and 55. During this time, the ovaries stop releasing eggs and the woman's menstrual cycle comes to an end. This leads to a decrease in the production of estrogen and progesterone, which can bring about symptoms like hot flashes, mood swings, and changes in sleep patterns. For men, reproductive ability ability declines more gradually than women, and it doesn't necessarily come to a clear abrupt stop. But testosterone levels do begin to drop as men age, and there may be a decrease in sperm count and fertility. So while men don't experience a sharp decline like women do with menopause, aging can still affect their sexual health and reproductive abilities. Another physical change that occurs during adulthood is the decline in mobility and flexibility. As we age, our muscles tend to lose mass and strength and our joints become stiffer. And this means that physical abilities that we once found easy, like climbing stairs or lifting heavy objects might become more challenging. For example, adults, experience some decrease in the range of motion in their joints, particularly in their hips and knees and back, which can limit their flexibility. Reaction time also slows through adulthood. The brain's processing speed tends to slow down, which can affect everything from sports performance to responding in conversations or even in emergencies. And finally, sensory acuity which is the sharpness of our senses, like our sight and our hearing, starts to decline throughout adulthood. Many adults begin to experience changes in their vision as they age, specifically in the ability to focus on close objects, and this will often require them to get reading glasses. Hearing is another sense that tends to decline with age, especially the ability to hear high frequencies. These changes in adulthood are a normal part of aging, and while they may present challenges, many of them can be managed with lifestyle adjustments, regular exercise, healthy nutrition, and medical intervention when necessary. So to finish today's video, let's do a few short questions for review. Remember, I'll read the questions out loud and you'll need to pause the video to determine the answer. Question number one says, Dr. Kamara conducted a study on the transition from childhood to adulthood. Dr. Kamara is interested in which variable? Question number two says, compared to when he was 17 years old, Kwame, who is now 25 years old, has noticed that he is better able to resist the urge to play video games all evening. What development in adolescence has allowed for his greater impulse control? Question number three says, Stagger's development of underarm hair is an example of. Question number four says, if a pregnant person contracts the rubella virus, their child may experience lifelong physical and cognitive function deficiencies. The rubella virus is considered to be a or an. So this video concludes today's lesson on physical development. 